Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Halifax International Security Forum in Nova Scotia, Canada, one of the world's leading gatherings of national security, military, diplomatic, and civil society uh, leaders. Our coverage here is sponsored on this 10th anniversary gathering by L3 Technologies and Leonardo DRS. And it's my honor to talk to Dixon Osborne uh, at the Center for Justice and Accountability. Uh, you. Um, uh, track basically and keep an eye on and make an issue of, of those who are uh, bad guys who have to be brought uh, to, to justice. Uh, after that, uh, you know, a great lobster dinner last night. Uh, it was ston astonishing that you told me there were 1,900 war criminals just in the United States alone, and I think that that's something that would stun many Americans. Talk to us a little bit about your project, the work you guys do, um, given that it's, it's so important and you know, in a time when a lot of global values um, and norms are under pressure, you know, what that tells us about the future. Certainly. Well, the Center for Justice and Accountability, our legacy is to carry on the legacy of the Nuremberg Principles. You know, that idea of, after World War II, that there would never, there would be never again. And the global community has really failed that promise of never again. So what we're trying to do at the Center for Justice and Accountability is to find ways to hold accountable perpetrators of these egregious crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes. Now in the United States alone, the Department of Homeland Security does estimate that there are 1,900 suspected war criminals from 50 different countries. Uh, and in our 20 years, this is our 20th anniversary, uh, you know, we've brought lawsuit after lawsuit against some of the most emblematic crimes of our times, uh, not only for perpetrators who are living here in the United States, but looking creatively at venues around the globe where we can try to get jurisdiction. Just to give you a few examples, uh, we represent 145 Cambodian Americans before the tribunal in Cambodia. And just this week, the uh, Khmer Rouge Tribunal, as it's known, came down with the decision that the two senior living leaders of the Khmer Rouge uh, are guilty of genocide and crimes against humanity. Uh, in a very different context, we brought the very first war crimes lawsuit against Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian regime. Uh, we allege that he is responsible for the murder of Marie Colvin, who was this incredible war correspondent who was killed while covering the siege of Homs. Uh, and we were able to... And a great new movie is out uh, about her uh, life and story. Yes, there's a major motion film as well as a documentary, both phenomenal and people should watch it. Uh, she, I mean, she was really uh, this inveterate reporter, just truly amazing, and killed in the line of duty. Uh, and we brought a lawsuit in Washington, D.C. under the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act, which gives us the ability to sue Syria as a state sponsor of terrorism for killing an American. But the idea of the lawsuit, and the judge could issue her opinion any time right now, uh, the idea of the lawsuit, though, is not that Bashar al-Assad is going to resign tomorrow uh, if he's found liable for this, but this paves the path. Uh, eventually, one day, one hopes that we will be able to have access and have in custody the senior leaders of the Syrian regime. And rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to get the evidence and the data, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now, we will have started that process. So those are two examples of the type of work that we're doing. Um, how are you concerned? Um, what concerns you about, um, right, I mean, hate crimes are up. Uh, that's documented in the, in the United States. Anti-Semitic hate crimes are up more than other uh, forms of hate crimes, unfortunately. And we had the episode, for example, in, in, in Pittsburgh, uh, the, the awful tragedy uh, that worshipers were, were in their synagogue and were, were gunned down. Um, are you concerned that some of these breakdowns in norms, what, what are you concerned about the global dialogue and how breakdowns in norms will affect um, bad actors around the world? Right. Well, if you take, I, I try to take the long perspective and remain very optimistic about our trajectory, even with these awful events like the uh, the hate crimes, the, the massacre, the synagogue in Pittsburgh, let alone what you see around the globe happening right now. Uh, now, the trend line, uh, we're also celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, this December. And if you, you know, that declaration also is accompanied by the Geneva Conventions, by the Convention Against Torture, by the United Nations, and the domestication of a lot of norms that uh, have benefits society around the globe for 70 years. Uh, it's still an unfinished business, clearly. Uh, and what we have to continue to work on is to try to make sure that that rule of law is in place so that when there are back act actors who do bad things, that they will be held to account for these egregious crimes. Um, you know, one of the, in the uh, opening uh, 
Uh, anybody who's been here before, there are extraordinary videos that start off uh, every one of the panel discussions and sessions. Uh, and one of them was do the right thing at the right time, right? That no policy is actually a policy. Um, when it comes to, for example, what's happening and happened in, in Syria um, against Yazidis or anybody else, any, any, you know, she, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's even trans cross sectarian lines uh, in some ways, these atrocities. Um, what is, the, the international community spends a lot of time talking about it, but oftentimes doesn't want to act on it. We said never again, and yet it's happened, as you said, again and again. What, you attend more of these conferences than I do, so that means you're more disappointed than I am in attending them and, and seeing the needle not move. What are the things the international community has to do if it's serious about stopping these sort of hate, these sort of uh, mass events? I mean, that's the $64 billion question is how do you prevent, mitigate, stop mass atrocities? And uh, you do need a global response and you need a reorientation uh, and the global community about how to do this. Uh, you really need investment on uh, uh, diplomacy, on economic development, on civil society uh, strengthening, rather than having to call in our armed forces, which should be called in only as a last resort, to try to then resolve some massive genocide that is taking place. Uh, and we've seen time and again that not only do we not take those initial steps, uh, the military is often too late to the game as well. And so we were left in the wake of these horrible genocides to try to deal with the truth of what happened, trying to, to uh, heal what has happened and to try to hold those accountable uh, who committed these atrocities. Now, I remain an optimist, though I'm also a pragmatist. And the optimist is that I think over the next 70 years, we will continue to make progress. The pragmatist is, is a methodical stepwise process. Now, in every country that has not adopted the Convention Against Torture, they need to. In every country that doesn't have the resources to ensure that the police are not torturing their citizens when they take them into custody, we need to make interventions to stop that. So there are a lot of things that need to happen collectively as a global community for us to continue the progress that we need to make so that Never Again actually will become a reality. Um, the long arm of the long right, Slobodan Milosevic, was finally brought up on trials uh, and tried, sadly, from the standpoint of those seeking justice. Uh, justice was not meted out, right? He, he, he died while he was in, in captivity. Um, Nazi war criminals sent back to Germany after having spent almost 70 years in the United States uh, living uh, as an American. Uh, many of these folks have lied in order to be able to get into the United States or other countries of refuge around the world. Sometimes governments have looked the other way. Other times, um, you know, uh, they've been duped. Is there, what better can the international community do in terms of at least tracking, verifying, uh, and identifying those folks so that they don't have safe refuge and that the prosecution of them becomes something that is accelerated, especially once you unmask the person, actually making the case is not necessarily as complicated as some people would think. Yeah, uh, a lot of very good questions with uh, simple and complicated answers. And let's just take the United States as an example. So Homeland Security says it has 19 individuals they suspect are war criminals from 50 countries. Uh, the tools that the United States have are insufficient. The main tool that they use uh, is going to be immigration fraud. So if somebody lied and came in to our country having lied about having participated in some kind of mass atrocity, the U.S. government typically will act, though it may take some time. You know, it can be 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years for them to actually find the individual and prosecute. That, to me, doesn't seem uh, satisfactory uh, or sufficient. Uh, one of the tools that our government lacks in fact, is a Crimes Against Humanity bill. This is the law that they used at Nuremberg, and it's the law the United States has helped include in the various tribunals that uh, we've helped to create uh, to address the atrocities in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda. Uh, the De Department of Justice needs a criminal tool like that that has the flexibility to bring a very serious criminal charge against individuals who've engaged in these activities. The same can be said around the globe. Uh, there is, I think, a growing movement, mostly in the U.S., Latin America, and Europe, of an idea of no safe haven, of trying to ensure that uh, culprits uh, do not get to leave their country and come somewhere else to live freely, that they uh, will be denied access to those liberties and privileges. But it then means that in those countries, we also need to develop the rule of law and the capacity and willingness of those countries to try the crimes that occurred within their borders. 
But how does the international community, for example, respond to what's happened to the Rohingya, uh, which has been just extraordinary? The international community has watched it, has complained about it, and yet the needle has barely moved. China's behavior toward Uyghurs is extraordinary, um, increasing spotlight on it, and yet... Yeah, <laughs> very good question. I don't, even, I don't even know where to go with You know what I mean? It's, it's like, yeah. okay. So one of the big questions is getting jurisdiction over the people who have engaged in criminal activity. Uh, and you no, know, for China and the Uyghurs, for example, it's not possible to go into China and to get some kind of accountability against the leaders there. That's going to be a much longer term conversation uh, to try to change that. With the Rohingya, what, what you do see is at least some movement, whether it will be successful or not is yet to be seen, but the ICC, International Criminal Court, issued an advisory opinion. Uh, Burma slash Myanmar is not a party to the Rome Statute and cannot be prosecuted before the, the ICC, but Bangladesh is a state party, and they made an argument that, they, that the, the Burmese military could not com complete the crime but for the fact that they you know, moved over the border back into Bangladesh, and that was the completion of the crime. And the ICC issued an advisory opinion saying, no, we can open a criminal inquiry to investigate this further. That could be a game changer if, in fact, they will recognize that as a crime. Uh, you also do see movement uh, you know, at the UN. They want to develop an independent mechanism like they have for Syria to try to collect and document evidence and be prepared for when they actually might be able to push forward uh, with criminal accountability. And for groups like mine at the Center for Justice and Accountability, you know, we're working with civil society groups. We're trying to figure out uh, what we can do either in terms of civil litigation or preparing criminal dossiers uh, that may be able to move that needle forward. Dixon Osborne, Executive Director of the Center for uh, Justice and Accountability. Uh, thanks very much. I'm glad we uh, connected and, and, and formally spoke on camera. Uh, extraordinarily important work, and I say that as, as an Armenian-American whose grandparents were survivors of uh, the Armenian genocide. Uh, amazing work and, and something that really deserves greater support and greater international attention to make sure that um, those people who've transgressed the worst and done the worst things uh, possible to other human beings pay the ultimate price. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.